Don't even look them in the eye. What? Don't even look them in the eye when you pass them on the street. What do you mean? I grew up in Chadfield, the town of 1800. You look everybody in the eye and say hi, don't you? Don't look them in the eye when you go on the streets. Oh, I guess I am from a small town in Minnesota. I'm not used to that. I acknowledge everybody. Don't, doesn't everybody? Nope, not in this case you don't. You're in the big city now. When I was a camp counselor in New York at Koinonia, one of the ELCA camps out there, we spent a weekend in Manhattan. Uh, part of our training was to beg for food on the streets for a day. Take all our watches and everything, our identity away. Give us a hard-boiled egg to barter with. And there you go, you're on the streets. But they told us, don't look anybody in the eye. Why is that? Well, then they may want to do something. They may take advantage of you. They don't like it. Invades their space. God, this is so different than how I grew up. How am I going to change after 21 years? Well, okay, I'll try it. But it just feels strange to not acknowledge people. And now it's not too tough, right? I, I, I don't make eye contact with some people, especially if I'm driving up in my car and I come to an intersection, someone has homeless, hungry. Yeah, I take a glance, but I try not to park right next to them so I don't have to acknowledge them. That's sad. After all my upbringing in the small town and in my Christian faith, that's tough. That's hard. I don't want to be taken advantage of. I know what they want. They want my hard-earned money, don't they? Hey, what do they do to, to deserve it or earn it? As far as I know, they're going to drive off from their Cadillac as soon as they're done here. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe not. Hmm. Oh, I'm looking at this lesson today about the Pharisee and thinking about the lessons from before. Remember Lazarus? You know, who died, and the, the, the man who stood outside his, his gate, who was ignored, is now next to Abraham, all buddy-buddy in heaven, and Lazarus is scorching down in who knows where. Lazarus ignored this man for all his life. And now this man is exalted with Abraham. This Pharisee who part of their culture was to ignore, and he makes sharp distinctions between them and them, us and them. Draw that line in the sand and make it exaggerated. Thank God I'm not like them over there. Now they are really sinners. I am really good. When you read this, you have to be careful not to discount any of the things he's doing. I mean, it's good to give a tenth to tithe. It's good to fast if that's what your faith belongs, you know, where it belongs. It's good to do some of these spiritual practices. And yet, where he gets caught up, where we get caught up, is to start saying, you know, look at me, right? Now I become the center of my world. Now I become the self-righteous guy that, that I disdain. That I become this Pharisee. Because I am making distinctions all the time. And we can't help it as a people. If it's not the African Americans, it's the gays. If it's not them, it's somebody else. We need to put on that other side of that line so we can say at least we're not like them. And yet, exactly what Jesus was talking about. This man, this tax collector, seemed to have a humility, a self-knowledge of his place in the world, not any better than anybody else, but maybe in his own mind, maybe a little less. Maybe not even enough to he could raise his eyes to heaven, to feel like he belongs to the child as a child of God. He can't even bring himself to do that much. And yet Jesus says he didn't do anything to deserve what he got. He doesn't do anything to deserve justification by God. He didn't do all the right things. He simply fell at the, on his knees and confessed with his heart his need for God. His own way that he could not bring himself to do the right things to make himself worthy. It all depended on God. And this tax collector knows that. He's brought to a place where he feels that. 
Sometimes we're brought to a place where we do all the right things, and pretty soon we're thinking we're pretty good. And then we start to ignore, because it might knock us off our pedestals of self-righteousness. <laughs> My question is, how does self-righteousness and contempt for others really help us? How does one-upmanship and co competition in some, in some ways really benefit all of us? I'm seeing more and more in, in companies that some people who do a lot of the, the grunt work are almost necessary evils to bring in income. They're micromanaged and held down and, and that kind of thing. And they really don't have a say in what goes on. They may have a better plan. They may have a better idea. They may have a sense of how they can be a team to operate. And yet, they're squashed. More and more leadership books that I read talk about being uh, well, a servant leader. Like Robert Greenleaf would say, a servant leader, you serve first. And that's how you lead. You bring people to be as a team. You accentuate their strengths. You listen to them. We all work together. We have different functions in our business, in our church, in our society. And no one is better than anybody else. We all have to have that sense of humility that we all have that earthiness. Hum humility is, is, comes from the word hummus. You know what hummus is, that, that earthy material that helps plants grow. The down-to-earth kind of sense that we're all in this together, aren't we? This self-awareness that this man, this tax collector had, is something that we strive for. Our place in the world. Maybe not better, maybe not worse, but kind of, we're all in this together. And the, the Pharisees' words of, I'm glad I'm not like the others, well, we're all like the others, aren't we? We all share common traits and characteristics. We all have that sin as part of who we are, genetic makeup. There's no way around that. So when we draw the line in the sand and say, I am here, and we're, we're, we're good, and, and those people on the other side of the line, they're the ones who need help. And they're the ones who need Jesus to help them. And I'm saying, well, yeah, Jesus is on the other side of the line. If you're making distinctions between you and them, us and them, then we push Jesus to the other side. Because we don't need him anymore. We've got all we need in ourselves. That's the second mistake the Pharisee made. He said, all, all he did it was on his, on his own. I tithed, I fasted, I did all these things. Now look at, I built myself up. Oh, God? Yeah, I think he rewards me for that. But it's all on, on me, because I did the right things. It's not to say that you don't do the right things, but have the correct attitude about them. The praying and the fasting, the scripture reading and the sharing and, and all this kind of thing are really good ways of enriching faith, as long as we know that it's dependent upon God, that God is the focus of all that. It doesn't make us any better or any worse than anybody else. <sighs> How many people here are ready to vote in November? How many people are to say, let's get this over with, and let's just vote, okay? Yeah, all right. And why is that? We're tired, aren't we? We're, this is an election I've never seen before. It just, I'm tired of, uh, of the attacks back and forth, the character attacks back and forth. And, you know, it gets old after a while. The contempt drawn on both sides is really old. This is the kind of thing that Jesus was talking about. They're building themselves up against the other. It's hard to watch. I, did, I couldn't even bring myself to watch the third debate because the second one I thought, why am I doing this? I want to see a leader. I want to see someone step up and, and really take charge and, and be for the people and have some sense of humility and some sense of awe of the position and some sense of, I don't know what to call it. Jesus was talking about those who are those who are righteous 
those who have a sense of God in their lives, who have a sense of humility, a sense of, of something special. I remember in high school reading the, a boy, a book called Black Boy. It was about racism, little black boy's sense of racism in the South. Very prevalent, very verbal, very out there in front of your face. And experiencing it in the North where it wasn't verbal, but it was there quietly behind the scenes. He had a sense that that was worse because there was a passive contempt for him and people he was a part of. He happened to be black. It wasn't aggressive, but it was passive. The ignoring someone else. The indifference towards someone else. I got a, a quote from Elie Wiesel. You know, he was that Jew was held in Germany in concentration camps and wrote several books later on. He quotes it like this. The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness. It's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy. It's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death. It's indifference. How we value and hold people honor in our eyes, in our hearts. How we sense that they are part of this world is just as much as we are. No better, no worse. To look them in the eye and hold them as a person. To say that you matter without judgment, without dismissal. Our saving grace in all of this is Jesus sees us, and he really sees us. Several times you see in Scripture, do you see? I saw. He sees us for who we are and whose we are. There is no passive contempt there. And as we read in the men's, I was read in the men's Bible study the other day, a quote from Isaiah 65, verse 2. God is telling the people of Israel, I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. So even though we're straying from the path, God is there waiting for us to embrace us, to hold us, to see us as only God can see us. And our attempts to do the same, the challenge to do the same in our lives, to see, to really see, the Christ in the other person. Amen.